Time. 2.35. Okay. So now we'll go, go live and start recording. All right, folks. Let's, uh, let's get started for the day. It's nice to see everybody. How are we, uh, how are we doing? Amazing. Phenomenal. Oh, that's great. Oh, I'm sorry. We can, we can talk about it later. Uh, well, it's nice to see everybody. If we could uh, quiet down, we'll get started here. It's great to see that we have more than three people, despite this course being streamed. Uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll, it seems to be kind of a linear reduction, which apparently is better than most courses on campus this semester. So I'll take it. Uh, it's, it's nice to see all of you guys. In terms of uh, beginning of class announcement stuff, I don't think there's much other than, you know, keep working on your homework. Many, uh, but not 100% of you uh, successfully did your nano quiz, but I think I've heard all the assorted special cases and problems and, and so on. Um, if you forgot to do your nano quiz, lucky for you, we drop the two lowest ones anyway. So that's what we're going to do with that. Um, if you had like a legitimate reason, you were sick, something went wrong, you were in the hospital, we, I've seen it all, that's, that's fine and we'll find an extension. Um, we're currently having like an old man on the internet problem where I don't know how to give those people an extension on their nano quiz. Um, but as soon as I figure that out, uh, we will pass the savings on to you. Um, any uh, questions, organizational things, uh, comments, concerns, jokes, ideas, interesting math problems? OK. Well, uh, in that case, let's get started with a uh, uh, lecture for today. We're going to continue our discussion of transformations. Uh, and notice that we followed kind of the same pattern as last week. Like last week, we talked first about one B spline, and then we talked about how to glue them together. <laughs> and somehow we're doing something very similar uh, this week, right? So, so in our last lecture, we talked about how to engineer like a single camera transformation or a single rotation or translation. Today's job is to glue them all together to compose together a scene. So that's basically our task for today, is to do what uh, graphics people typically call hierarchical modeling which is something that I think we pretty much justified in our previous lecture, right? The idea that essentially when we make a model, there are all kinds of coordinate systems that are nested within one another. And there's a lot of bookkeeping that needs to happen in a typical computer graphics system to figure out like where I am when I'm drawing or modeling a particular object, right? So that's the high level picture. So to add a little bit more to that high level picture here, uh, of course, our, our main goal in 6837 is to make 3D models of whatever this guy's name is, this Optimus, whatever. Uh, and uh, essentially, in order to do that, uh, we have to compose together uh, parts of more and more uh, complexity, right? So at the base level, uh, this 3D model is built out of maybe triangles or parametric curves and surfaces. But these are really just building blocks, right? And, and typically, when we make things, we, you know, in this case, he's really made out of, like, mechanical parts. And probably many of them were made in their own factories and then composed together on the, on the fly. I, actually, there's like a, I'm not sure, are these things born or manufactured? I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, there's, there's, I've, I've got a lot of questions and I feel like, uh, what, what's his face, uh, like, Shia LaBeouf is unlikely to address them. But in any event, the, uh, the, the basic point here is that, you know, we have a bunch of simple primitive objects and we like to build up things of more and more complexity by composing them together. OK, so our plan for today is to have a little bit of a recap from our previous lecture. Remember, we talked all about vectors, points, coordinates, and so on. Starting today, I'm going to get, I'm going to like basically skip all that like, you know, tilde versus arrow versus bold versus whatever notation from last time because I can't ever remember it. Uh, and instead, we're going to use more standard linear algebra. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about what it means to keep track of a kinematic chain. Now, kinematic chain is a phrase that you might have heard before. For instance, if you've taken a robotics class, uh, it's exactly the same kinematic chain that you think about there, right? So when I'm controlling a robot, right, you have all these different parts that are hinged on each other. And oftentimes, you have something like an end effector, right, like a grasping hand, and you're trying to reach out to grab some object in front of the robot. But of course, the controls that you have are like the angles of the joints. And so optimizing for like how the end effector reaches and touches an object in front of it, for example, is exactly the same problem we have to solve in graphics to animate a character, right? We want to put it in a given pose. And typically, the way that we articulate these characters is by articulating individual joints. We're just doing it virtually instead of uh, robotically. 
which of course makes our life a lot easier, right? We don't have to worry about stuff breaking. Uh, in fact, actually, I remember um, I was around when, you know, when Wally came out and they wanted to make this like Wally robot. And the guy I was working for had this clever idea where they were going to take the animation curves from the Wally movie and then just like drop them on this, like they actually made a Wally robot with like roughly the same articulation, which is like not actually that hard, right? Like it's like two wheels and a hinge. But <laughs> what they found is that like the forces, you know, like when Wally makes whatever motion, you know, during the animation, were like enough to like launch it off of this planet. Um, so like appa apparently, you know, the, the, the animation curves that we have uh, in the virtual world really, really don't align with the, the physical one, right? So, so robotics people have it a lot harder. Um, apparently the, the tests for this robot were really entertaining and, and a little sad. Um, okay, so, so that's our, our plan for the day. Um, and with that, we'll get started. And then basically uh, that'll be the end of our discussion of transformations. And starting next time, I believe, we'll start talking about uh, animation. Um, so so we're, we're getting there, slowly. Okay, so remember in our, our previous lecture, we talked quite a bit, I would argue almost to a pedantic level, uh, distinguishing between vectors and points and coordinate frames and bases and so on. And essentially we introduced a lot of different um, operators and terminology, which is really something that you've probably already seen before in your linear algebra course. We just wanted to kind of call it out and make sure that you understand what it is relative to a graphic system. I thought I'd pause really quickly before we start today's official discussion and give you one quick trick for, for deriving these kinds of matrices that I think is kind of handy. Um, and that's uh, just, just something that, that, at least in my, like it's really not that exciting, but it's just in my mind a little bit easier to remember how to, how to do these things. Um, in particular, let's say that I'm working in two by two matrices. So I'm on the plane. It's my favorite kind of matrix. One by one is actually easier. So, uh, let's say that I have a matrix A, B, C, and D, and I multiply it by the first standard basis vector, 1, 0. What do I get? A, C. Thanks, guys. Hopefully you figured out by now that I'll wait until you, you speak up with, with answers to my dumb questions. Um, and similarly, if I have the same matrix, No, you're, you're right, of course. I, I, <laughs> I multiply it by the second standard basis vector. I, indeed, as our, our colleague points out, we get B, D. Okay. Wow. Thank you. I know, right? I'm, I'm really good at this particular matrix multiply. And, and, and why am I so good at it? Well, did I actually like do the like left, right, up, down thing? Yes. <laughs> it's true. Like, you know that like joke about the butterfly going back and forth between the trains and... Einstein, never mind. Um, but uh, uh, no, I, the, the, the basic trick that I can remember is that if I take a matrix and I multiply it by a standard basis vector, what I get is the corresponding column. Do you see that? So like when I multiply by 1, 0, I got the first column AC. When I multiply by 0, 1, I got the second column BD. Now, this isn't like super insightful. I think we all could have known that. <laughs> But um, why is this kind of a handy thing to point out? So let's say that I give you, I want the matrix that takes an object and rotates it like 45 degrees. Now there are two ways to do this. One is you go on Wikipedia and you Google, you know, like rotation matrix. I see a lot of nodding. No, guys, no, we, we, we're going to think a little bit before we, we open up the internet. Um, let's think about what this is saying. This is saying that I can get the first column of my matrix by knowing its action on the first standard basis vector. And similarly, I can get the second column by knowing its action on the second standard basis vector. So let's, let's draw a picture of what that means. So let's say, again, we want the matrix that uh, rotates uh, counterclockwise <laughs> by, say, uh, 45 degrees, like that, OK? So let's draw a picture of what it's doing to the first standard basis vector. So let's say. This way is x, and that way is y. What does the first standard basis vector look like? Don't make that rude gesture at me. No, he's right. It's, it's, it, it points right here, right? This is like the, the 1, 0, right? So, so what is the, uh, the action of my rotation matrix on that thing? So it rotates at 45 degrees, right? So I have a picture that looks like that. I'm very bad at drawing unit, unit vectors, but, but hopefully you get the point, right? So this angle is 45 degrees. <laughs> 
OK? So what are the coordinates of this point? Yeah, that's right. There's like something involving square roots of 2 and so on, but I'm a bad mathematician. So like the x coordinate here is cosine 45 degrees, and the y coordinate is sine 45 degrees. <laughs> yeah? I believe that's the square root of 2 over 2 for both of those coordinates, in fact. Ah, fine. See, I, could, I can do math. OK, so similarly, I'll make it a little smaller this time. Let's say I take the, stand, the second standard basis vector and I rotate it 45 degrees counterclockwise. So it'll end up like that. Right? So this is our 45 degree angle. So what is the coordinates of this vector? So yeah, so there'll be minus sine of 45 degrees. So that's minus square root of 2 over 2. I should have made it 30 to break the symmetry, but that's OK. Like that. OK? So what did I do? I said, well, I have a matrix that rotates stuff. And in particular, I know how to rotate now the first standard basis and the second standard basis. Cool? Like, this is a picture I can draw. <laughs> OK. So once I've drawn this picture, remember my task. My goal at the end of the day was to derive my 2 by 2 rotation matrix. And now, how can I do that? Well, I know it's action on the first guy and the second guy. So all I do is I stick them together in, as, as the columns of that matrix. right? So I'll get square root of 2 over 2, the x coordinate, the y coordinate, to be a little careful, like that, minus the square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2. And there's our rotation matrix. That makes sense? So like, I, I, I mean, this is like a, I haven't done anything, right? Like all I've done is, is derive rotation matrices. but I feel like this, this is a concrete way to think about the entries of this matrix. Is like the first column is what the matrix does to the first standard basis vector. The second column is what the matrix does to the second basis vector. And you can draw pictures of those two things and then just kind of compose them together. That makes sense? It's just like a little mnemonic. <sighs> OK. So that's that. Um, so in general, uh, of course, we are going to compose together lots of these matrices. Remember in our last lecture, we talked about rotations, translations, skier, skier, scale, shear, uh, 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 camera projection, other stuff. And, and in each one of these was a different matrix acting on vectors, maybe in, in homogeneous coordinates. So today, we're going to be composing a lot of these things together. And so the really important viewpoint is going to be Remembering, oh boy, remembering the input and output of, of every single matrix, right? So the idea that, like, like for instance, in this notation, it's just debatable, but my graphics colleague, uh, uh, Bo, kind of liked it, and I didn't have an argument against it. Um, here, we're thinking of M12 as taking things, vectors that are in coordinate system 2, and outputting vectors that are in coordinate system 1. By the way, this notation, no matter what you choose for your index, is going to confuse you. <laughs> Do you see that? Because, because matrix multiply kind of goes from the right to the left. So, so this notation is kind of favoring like coupling the twos together. But it's also a little confusing because if you read it from left to right, it looks like from one to two. But that's not right. This is from two to one. Do you see that? I'm going to repeat this like 75 times. And it's not really for your benefit. It's because I'm bad at this. And I'm just going to keep saying it to convince myself that this is true. OK. <sighs> right. So, so in general, we're going to use this kind of notation today. So if I see a matrix that's indexed by two things, i, j, then we're thinking of that as a matrix that is taking something in coordinate system j and putting it in coordinate system i. Okay? And the reason that we do that is that now we can have things like, you know, maybe I have something in coordinate system 1, and then I have like, you know, some you know, expressions that look like this, where I'm going to like chain together a bunch of matrix multiplies. This is kind of nice because now we can check if our, our expression makes sense by kind of coupling things together. Right? Does that, does that notation make some sense to you guys? So for instance, if I had um, an expression that looked like m21, m32x1, you know, like I got it wrong, you can immediately see that something is a little bit funky, right? Because this guy is supposed to act on things that are in coordinate system 3, and, and, and that hasn't happened here. Oh, I mean, in coordinate system 2. Ah! Regardless, neither one of them is a one. <laughs> OK. So, so that's our, our basic setup here. So for instance, um, 
Oh, I think we've already basically derived a ro rotation matrix, so maybe we don't need to do that here. Um, but the phrase that we're going to use a lot today is, or, or word really, is chain. Right? And chain is exactly what it sounds like. We just have a whole series of these matrix multiplies that we're going to apply one after the next to take us from one point sequentially into some bigger or smaller coordinate system. And of course, we talked about many different transformations that we can combine this way. So for example, let's uh, apply our newfound skill here uh, and, and, and think about a translation uh, matrix. So remember, M12 takes things in coordinate system 2 and puts them into coordinate system 1. Now, if it's a translation matrix, um, we're in the plane, so how big should our matrix be in homogeneous coordinates? Three by three. three by three, thank you. It's always the same guy that answers. It's like a whole left side of this room that I'm, I'm missing here. Um, all right, so remember our convention in these matrices is that the last row is 0, 0, 1. Translation matrices don't rotate. So what is the upper left two by two block of this matrix? I hear it. Identity, thank you. Thank you for speaking up. OK, so this is the identity. It's now in pretty good shape. You know, If you're like counting your exam points, you're doing pretty well. Um, now the question is, what's here? And now, now your dyslex like dyslexic instructor gets himself all confused. Is this PQ or is this minus P minus Q? Right? <laughs> That's, I, th I think it's a really critical thing to get right. And now if we go back to our picture, what do we know? We know that if we take the origin in 2, then it should look like what in coordinate system 1? It should look like P comma Q, right? So in other words, if I take this matrix, oh, my shoe's untied, and I, I, I multiply by the origin. First of all, what are the coordinates of the origin? I, I see this gesture, but there are three coordinates. Zero, zero, one, thank you. OK. Uh, and, and what should I get on the right-hand side? I, I'm curious if you can make the hand gestures for the right-hand side, too. I'm, I'm seeing like a Y, M, C. Uh, right. Uh, no, so, so uh, right. In, in this uh, coordinate system, that point will go to P, Q, 1. OK? So now we, can, now we can figure out the proper sign of this last column. It's P, Q, 1. Yes? Uh, that's a good question. So that's actually just by convention is, is one way to put it. But a, a better answer, so uh, right to repeat for our internet people, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, somebody commented that I should repeat questions. Um, the question was, whether, why should the last row here be 0, 0, 1? Um, there are a lot of different ways to, to figure that out. I mean, essentially, you want to leave that one coordinate alone. And that's really what's going on with the 0, 0, 1, right? Anything else is going to kind of introduce other linear combinations of the x, y, and w that you wouldn't want. Yeah, that's the better answer. I'm going to stand here and tie my shoes for a moment so that I don't fall on my face. Well, I might fall on my face, but not because of the shoelace. OK. Right, a different way to get that 0, 0, 1, by the way, is to do that trick that we just did. Right, you could like say, well, what's the action on 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1? And, that's, and you'll convince yourself that that's the proper output. In general, anything that doesn't have like a camera transformation in it, that's going to be the last, the last row. Yes? Are we trying to find the matrices like 2 to 1, not from 1 to 2? That's right. So coordinate system 2, the origin is 0, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 1, I guess, sorry. And coordinate system 1, it's PQ1. So this is, this is correct. But it is dyslexia inducing. This stuff is, is really easy to get wrong. <laughs> I'll let, you, I'll let you think about it some more. It, it, it is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is correct. Uh, and similarly, we've already derived the uh, rotation matrix. Oops, I see his hand. Sorry, why is the origin 0, 0, 1? Why is the 1 in the last? Ah, yeah, so it could have been 0, 0, 7. That would have been fine. <laughs> right, remember our homogeneous coordinate system, uh, when, we want, when we have a point, so the origin is a point, it's not a vector, right? Then the last coordinate of a point is a 1, or at least a non-zero value. These are great questions. I'm glad we're, we're thinking critically today. There was another question here, I think. Oh, just letting me know there was a question. It's good. It's uh, you know, easy to get tunnel vision up here. OK, so we all already derived a rotation matrix. Remember that that would go on the upper left block of, of this guy. 
And so now, if we wanted to do something like rotate and then translate, we just multiply these things together. And remember from our last lecture, one thing we have to be the tiniest bit careful about is remembering the order. Yeah, and, and this is the kind of thing that is so easy to get wrong in your code. I say that a lot because like, it's going to happen. Like, it, it, it will happen in your code. It has happened to me. It will happen to you. Um, and so essentially, what, what's going to go on is that we'll have this entire chain, you know, like maybe I rotate and translate and rotate and translate and rotate and translate. And this is very typical in graphic system as we, we compose together different pieces of, of complicated characters. So does the basic setup make sense and, and kind of how we're deriving these, these matrices? I think it's one of these things that like is easy to agree with and then it's like mildly uncomfortable to derive every time you, you do the math. I certainly feel that way, but that's because I didn't prepare for lecture. Okay, so, um, right, so that's our, our basic story here. So what we've described so far is a procedure called forward kinematics. Has anybody heard the phrase forward or inverse kinematics before? If you want to like show off at a bar and you're hanging out at the SIGGRAPH conference, you might say like forward, like inverse kinematics is like IK, right? That's what the graphics people say. Um, and essentially what we're doing is, is the forward kinematics, which is the process of multiplying by a bunch of matrices to get from one coordinate system to another, okay? So in general, the term forward kinematics comes from robotics, uh, and it's really the idea that like there's lots of different joints and they're connected by different rigid motions. And of course, there are many different types. You know, there's, there's hinges, there are ball and socket joints, saddle joints, sliding joints, and all of these are just different restrictions of that space of rotations and translations that we've already talked about. So in general, joints can have zero to six degrees of freedom in 3D. I think it would be very hard to engineer a joint that like shears <laughs> an object, uh, which is why you can't really have more than six, even though there's, what, nine entries in this, this matrix here. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, probably the simplest one and the one we could all write code for would be a zero degree of freedom joint, which is roughly glue. <laughs> okay, so in character animation, I think many of you maybe have even, like if you kind of poke around on graphics YouTube, kind of seen figures that look like these. And essentially what's going on here is that there's a different ellipse for every coordinate system in this articulated human figure. By the way, when I, when I use the phrase articulated, I'm not sure I've defined that carefully. Essentially, the idea here is going to be that when we compose together an animated model or a model with all these different moving parts, the articulation is kind of telling you how the different parts glue together, right? So it's saying that like this arm is attached to the upper arm and there's a, um, you know, this, this kind of matrix that hooks them together, which is parametrized by a rotation, for example, right? And this is the kind of thing that we can specify in our code uh, easily enough. And the high level point here is that we usually have joints that are organized in a hierarchy, right? Like maybe the center of the body is attached to the upper arm, is attached to the elbow, is attached to the wrist and so on. I think it would be pretty atypical to have these things in a loop, certainly in a graphic system. And maybe there's like a weird robot out there that has like a loop of joints, but I, don't, I wouldn't know how to think about that. Okay, and so, so there's a lot of kind of engineering decisions that have to happen when you make uh, an animated character. Like where do you put the base? Like what order do you hook things together is not always 100% obvious uh, and so on. Typically the most important kinds of joints are just the rotational ones. So I think it's pretty typical to kind of and design a kinematic chain that kind of alternates between rotation and translation, right? So the translation is like the rigid part, like your arm, and then the rotation is like the joint. I don't think there are too many animated characters that have like sliding joints. So those, uh, you know, you can come up with an ex exception for any rule. So a typical joint is, uh, parameterized by a bunch of different numbers. And I think these are pretty natural, right? Like a joint is essentially describing how it attaches to the thing on top of it in the kinematic chain, right? And so in order to do that, maybe you have an offset or displacement, you have some kind of relative orientation. Um, and then, especially in robotics, of course, most joints have uh, limits. Uh, you know, there's only so far that you can, you can bend. And so uh, these are the kinds of things that are specified. And Notice that it's, it's identical in robotics and in computer graphics. So in robotics, these things are, are basically inherited by the hardware that you went out and buy. Um, in graphics, uh, these parameters are usually defined by the artists. You know, like I make, uh, I, I'm like running out of animated characters. Mickey Mouse, oh no, now I have to take this off of YouTube. <laughs> um, you know, I, <laughs> whatever, I, I make uh, Mickey Mouse and you know, I, the lawyers are coming. Uh, they're like remarkably efficient. 
um, you know, and his elbow like can't bend past you know 180 degrees, and 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 maybe that's specified in the code to prevent the artist from doing something that like the Disney Corporation would not approve of. Okay, <laughs> so that's our, our sort of typical uh, kinematic chain, and this is the kind of diagram that you end up with a lot, right? So like you have a, bit, a bunch of different joints. The dotted lines here are specifying how they're connected together, and then the angles and and the offsets are kind of given one after the next. And, and that's you know, also used to specify robotic arms and, and many other things. Does that story make sense? Yes? So, is there a person in the animation and the artist, so like, if the artist wants to do something, do you make the platform for them to be able to move the arm? Or, or do you like, like code, do you like code it to move the arm itself, if that makes sense? Sure. So uh, the question, let me see if I can translate a little bit. So the question was like, how do you do this in practice? You know, like if an artist wants to make a character whose arm moves, like who's the person that actually articulates that motion? Um, it turns out that a lot of software, especially for character animation, really does expose that to the artist, like where they place the joints. But oftentimes this actually happens in two different stages of the graphics pipeline. So a very typical thing to do is to first make a 3D character in what people call a T-pose, which is roughly that. <laughs> And so like that's like a 3D model will we'll, we'll make that using a 3D modeling tool that looks roughly like like clay, right? And then you'll go back and articulate it, right? So you'll like attach a skeleton on the inside and then what we'll talk about uh, next lecture, I believe, uh, is a process called skinning where essentially you have this guy in the T-pose and now I have the skeleton embedded in the interior. So like if I move the skeleton, how should the, the skin move in response to that, right? So we'll kind of attach it to the underlying uh, thing. So it turns out coming up with these skinning weights, like how the skin is attached to the bone, is an annoying problem. Some artists paint it on. Uh, they're also, it's an open research problem to do that automatically. Uh, in fact, like our research group just published something like three months ago on how to do that. This is a, this is a, a problem that like is continuing to be studied. Yes? Um, going back to the question, Let's see here. So the question was, you know, why would a hand twisting be two degrees of freedom and a shoulder be three? So I'm not an anatomist, anatom anatomer. <laughs> I don't know much about anatomy, but uh, the space of rotations is three dimensional, right? There's roll, pitch, and yaw. So like think about, you know, if, you, if you're driving, flying an airplane, right? There's like a lot of different ways you can rotate the airplane, right? Like this, this and this, right? <laughs> and each one of those, you know, some of those are more disastrous than others. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I think that you're, if I recall, I actually like, I started taking a personal training course and then I dropped out. Your, your shoulder is one of these joints that's like extremely flexible and can go in like all kinds of different degrees of freedom. Your wrist, I'm trying to think of what the two dimensions would be. Yeah, I guess you can't, like if you pivot this way, that's really your upper arm. I'd have to think about it. I don't know. It's a good question. I'll let you guys like pull out an anatomy textbook and, and you can let us know from, from Piazza. Yes? Ah, that's a great question. So uh, the question was, uh, I, I see a word here I don't know, which is the word quaternion. Um, right, so in general, we haven't actually specified how to, we haven't described how to specify a rotation. Right? Like I'm telling you, like rotate, but what does that mean? Well, well, one thing it can mean would be a rotation matrix, right? Um, but there's actually a lot of different ways to parametrize the space of rotation. So like roll, pitch, and yaw would be one, right? So that would be like an angle this way, followed by an angle that way, followed actually by a second angle this way. This is sometimes called Euler ZYZ angles, if you Google it. Those are uh, actually quite problematic for animation. Um, so if you uh, search for the term gimbal, gimbal lock, you know this phenomenon? So there's, there's this uh, device in an airplane. I think this is like airplanes in like the 1940s, right? That like was, was kind of specifying the rotation of the airplane and specified by, by Euler angles, right? So you could, you could use these things to actually control motion. And there's an issue with Euler angles, which is that they like end up having a like multiple cover at a certain singular point. And so what would happen is like your airplane would reach a certain configuration. It would be really hard to get out of it because like these rotations like kind of didn't, don't take you there. Um, the quaternions is, a, I'm describing that extremely poorly. You should, you should Google it. Um, the quaternion is a different way to specify rotations that doesn't have uh, this kind of problem. Um, but it does have other issues. It's actually not quite the same as the space of rotations. It's a double cover of that set. There's like a weird 
my PhD advisor who used to teach this stuff would try and demo it and it always really weird the students out. Like if you take a belt and you twist it one time and you kind of rotate it around itself, you'll, you can find the double cover of quaternions. It has to do with like this kind of toroidal cover of the space. If you give a lecture on this and you start pulling off your belt without giving the students any context, <laughs> that can, can cause a problem. Anyway, so from a high level, the point is that when we say specify a rotation, you have to say like, what does that mean? Like how, like, is it angles? Is it some vector? Is it like a vector, which is a rotation angle, like axis plus an angle? There are a lot of different ways to do it out there. Great question. Any others? I had too much coffee today. I like saying a lot of words. Okay. Right, so this brings us to the most important term of our discussion today, which is forward kinematics. Interestingly, we, we call it inverse kinematics is IK. I don't think we call forward kinematics FK. I think we typically just call it forward kinematics. Um, but in any event, the basic point of, of forward kinematics is that if I know the position of the base and I know all the different matrices that I have to compose together to move from coordinate system to coordinate system, then essentially if I have some point like in the coordinates of my finger, I can get the point in the coordinates of the base by just multiplying them all together, right? And so a forward kinematic algorithm would do things like pose a robot, like figure out where all the triangles are by knowing the different matrices in the kinematic chain. Does that make sense? It's like one of these terms for something that like doesn't need a term. You know, like it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's, that's what I would do. If like if I knew all the angles of all the joints, then I could easily figure out the position of all the different parts on the robot. And that process is called forward kinematics. Okay, so if we want to add complicated notation <laughs> to the forward kinematics uh, procedure, uh, here's one way I could do that. So let's say that I make a giant vector theta, and theta contains all of the angles of all the joints, and maybe displacements, like if I have one of those sliding joints. Then essentially, the idea is that I'd like to know where the end effector is in world space. End effector is like fancy robot term for like hand, <laughs> right? And so in order to do that, you know, I need to compose together all the different joint matrices. So I can think of that as like the end effector E is a function F of the joint angles theta. That's the notation on the slide. Let's pause for a second and let us kind of digest that, think about it for a second, look back on our life choices, all that. Does this, does this notation make sense? So like the effector is like a position in space. The theta is like all the joint angles. So we're going from the theta to the effector. Yes? Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, the question was like, well, why isn't there like the length of the joint? I think typically you kind of think of that as built into the function f because it's not changing. But you're right, like if I had like a squishy character where like maybe the arm could get longer or shorter, like an octopus or something, then those kind of, of, of parameters would also be in theta. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, so f is an extremely nonlinear function. f is very complicated. Which I think is, by the way, it's kind of easy to neglect. Like, f feels simple because, like, algorithmically it's not hard to code, right? It's just multiplying a bunch of matrices. But, like, for instance, the rotation matrix is like cosines and sines of the angle, that joint angle, right? So if I compose together like five of them, that's like the product of five cosines and sines to get me from one position to another. Yeah, so f is, is complicated. Any other? Uh, Questions? These are great questions, by the way. I'm glad you guys are awake. Okay, so like here's forward kinematics in action. So I have a point P, he's in, he, or she is in local coordinates of the uh, hand, and I'd like the uh, position of the point P in the coordinates of the body. So essentially, what do I do? Well, I just multiply a bunch of matrices M together, right, which go from, you know, coordinate system three to coordinate system two to one, and eventually to the body. And um, this is what you guys will all code up in your homework uh, too. Um, and of course, if I add more detail, it starts, you can start to appreciate why this is complicated, right? Like essentially we ping pong between rotations and translations, right? Like there's a 30 degree angle here, and then there's this translation by four to go to our colleague's question. Notice that the four was kind of not built into the theta because we're just assuming the robot's arm doesn't change length. And then, you know, there's this 50 degree angle there. So you're kind of working your way from the tip all the way back to the body. This expression makes sense to everybody. The key things to get right are the order of the matrix and like the sign of all the angles and the displacements. Those are the two things that are easy to get wrong. Okay, so 
Forward kinematics sounds kind of easy, right? Like it's just a bunch of matrix multiplies, and and indeed forward kinematics really isn't so complicated. Um, it's it's annoying to code only because we have to make sure we get the matrices right and the transposes are in the right place, all that good stuff. Can anybody think of a problem with forward kinematics when it comes to like interacting with an artist? I'll give you a hint. Like let's say I have a robot or like an animated character, like Homer Simpson, and he wants to reach out into the refrigerator and grab something. Yes. Yeah, so you might only want to move one part of the robot. That's actually easy enough to do in forward kinematics, right? I would just leave some joints alone and mess with others. That's the bigger point. So let's let's think about that some more. Like, what, what could go wrong? I, I, I see a hand back here. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Notice the word backward hiding in there. Um, yeah, let's, let's think some more. Uh, there are just a lot of solutions, too, for how you could reach out. Still yeah, so there's all kinds of problems here. Let me, let me summarize our, our colleagues' comments here a little bit. So again, I've got my animated character. They have a hand, and they want to reach into the fridge and grab out spaghetti sauce, right? So let's think about what you have to solve as an artist. Let's see if you guys can all do this really quick. Let's say that I'm standing roughly three feet away from my laptop, and I want to touch the screen. Quickly, give me the joint angles of my elbow, my torso, my shoulder, and my wrist that I need to, to, to have to touch the screen. Yeah, it's not a problem that we think about very much, right? It's something we do naturally. And that's because typically when we animate, we're not thinking in terms of joint angles, we're thinking in terms of poses, right? Like, I want to touch something in front of me. I'm not thinking about like the articulation of every one of my joints. I'm thinking about positions in world space. Right? And so like when I'm doing forward kinematics, right, I'm not animating the pose of my robot or my character. I'm animating the joints. Right? And those can actually be really hard to control in terms of like their overall position in the 3D scene, for example. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, moreover, our colleague points out a good point, which is that there's also issues with uniqueness here. Right? So let's say that I stand here, and now I stand more like you know, one or two feet from my laptop. And I say, well, what's the proper set of joint angles for, for grabbing the corner of my laptop? I'm going <laughs> to, I just injured my shoulder. I should be careful. I grab on my laptop. There's actually more than one solution, right? I can pivot this way. And all of these things actually solve that problem if the only goal I had was to touch this point. Moreover, let's say that I step four feet away and I say, touch the corner of my laptop. Now there's no solution to my problem I, without you know, some, some extreme uh, things going on. So, if the forward kinematics problem is to go from joint angles to the poses of your characters, the inverse kinematics problem is the opposite of that. So the inverse kinematics problem says, like, OK, I don't care about the fact that like, your robot happens to be parametrized by a bunch of joint angles. Like, that's, just, that's a you problem. Like, you're, you're the guy that made the robot that way. Like, I want to put the robot here, and I want his arm to touch this thing. Find me the joint angles that accomplish that goal. Right? And that inverse kinematics problem is one, again, that shows up both in graphics and in robotics. Right? In robotics is also very typical. Like, you want to grasp onto a thing, but your robot is parametrized by like, the motors that are moving. And there's an extremely nonlinear relationship between those parameters and the actual pose in space. Right? And so inverse kinematics is trying to go the other way. So remember our, our notation here. Right? We, th we said that E was the position of our end effector, like the hand. And that was the function of a bunch of like joint angles and other parameters. And then we had this function f, which was going from the thetas to the e's. So the inverse kinematics problem is just doing the opposite of that. The question is, given e, can I come up with a function g that gives me all the thetas? And like we've already identified, this is not an easy problem. In fact, it's not obvious that it has a solution, right? Like, there's no clear function g. It might be non-unique. It might not have a solution, and so on. And moreover, as we pointed out, this function that goes from the thetas to the e's is extremely complicated. <laughs> right? So inverting it is, is not obvious at all. Basically, if you haven't got the memo yet, like essentially what I'm trying to convince you is like this is a hard problem. <laughs> yeah? um, and in fact, this is a problem, again, that people continue to study. Right? Like, 
somehow the most natural way you might want to animate a character is by IK, but that's exactly the one you don't really have control over. And indeed, you see that a lot in video games, right? Like when you see this kind of jerky motion and like you're playing a video game and like the character reaches out and suddenly like their elbow snaps into some other face. And that's because maybe like it's solving an you know, IK problem at every frame, but there's no like consistency happening and like... Yeah, clipping is a, a different matter, but but yeah, there, there's all kinds of, of challenges here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe like have people ever taken videos and shown like the videos for like angles and like how to make it like Oh, absolutely. You know, if you're if you're making a, a film, at the end of the day, if your IK solution is like weird and snapping all over the place, like nobody wants to to see Iron Man like having <laughs> like a seizure, you know. And and and, and so like Indeed, yeah, you, you, your poor artist then has to sit there and, and manually correct the angles until the motion looks right. And in fact, like, I think your artist is probably doing Newton's method by hand. It's not so great. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in general, in movie studios, like any time there's some hard computational problem we don't know how to solve, artists are not very expensive, and we hire many of them to do it by hand, which is not great. Any other questions about IK? Yeah. Yeah, motion capture is another uh, context for, for inverse kinematic, right? So uh, we'll talk about motion capture a little bit more later in this course, but like, you know, maybe I have some animated character and I don't want to pay for artists to move their joints around. So instead, I'm going to actually film a person in 3D space and attach a bunch of fiducial markers to their body. And now as they move, I need to infer the joint angles of the actor and then project those onto an animated character, for sure. Yeah, these are all great applications of this stuff. So the key point here is that inverse kinematics like, feels like a reasonable problem, but it's actually a really difficult one computationally. And oftentimes there are infinite solutions. You know, if I want to touch the blackboard here, I can pivot about a point, for example. And the more joints that I have, probably the more non-unique it is. Uh, moreover, sometimes there are no solutions. And very rarely can we solve the IK problem analytically, meaning like, is there a formula to go from the E's to the thetas? So instead, we have to come up with algorithms to do it. Now, inverse kinematic algorithms are not ones that we'll be implementing in this course. If you're very ambitious about your extra credit on assignment two, I guess you, I saw an eyebrow go up. Um, I guess you could uh, implement an IK technique, but they're, they're actually quite hard to get right, and, and, and many of them really, really aren't so stable. And so one way that you can understand IK is that it's, it's really just solving a system of equations. Here I've written for you like kind of a Gigantic one, just to make a point. Um, but like, let's say that these are all the thetas that are involved in our skeleton. You know, like the, the head and the torso and the body and what, whatever, right? Like all the different angles. Then really, I'm solving this system of equations where I have like some position for my end effector, and it's equal to this matrix, which is really a function of like a million angles, times the position in the local coordinates, right? And your goal is to find all of these different angles so that this relationship is true. Right? So it's just a system of equations in disguise. It's like robots in disguise, but less, less interesting. And so, um, right, so the IK problem is just trying to invert this relationship. I think we said that, basically that sentence in about six different ways now. Okay, so very briefly I'll mention one algorithm for IK, which is the one that everybody talks about first and also never works, um, which is uh, Newton's method. Many of us have probably encountered Newton's method in some context or another. If you haven't, that's cool. So here's the basic idea. Um, this function from thetas to e's is extremely nonlinear. What do I mean when I say that? I mean that it's like curvy, like there's like cosines and sines and things, right? And unfortunately for us, basically the only system of equations that like humans know how to solve consistently are, are like linear, right? Like ax equals b. So what could we do if, if I wanted to approximate a solution to this E equals F of theta problem, right? So I have, um, remember my input data is E and my output data is theta. It, that's, that's the IK problem, right? So I would like um, to solve this. But the problem is that this F is like composing like sines and cosines and all kinds of stuff and they're all multiplied together. That feels complicated. What do we do in, in calculus, like when functions are complicated and we don't feel like coping with it? We use a Taylor series, right? This is kind of a typical thing, you know, like this is nonlinear, so let's make it linear and ignore higher order terms. 
And indeed, we could do that here, right? So I could um, take my function here, and I could say, well, this is roughly equal to the uh, Jacobian of f. You guys remember this, this term here? Jacobian is the matrix of first derivatives, right? Um, evaluated at some theta naught times like theta minus theta naught plus f of theta naught, right? And this is just an approximation, but this is a linear, this is like an ax equals b, right? Like what, what's my unknown here? It's theta, right? So this is a linear system of equations that I can actually solve, yeah? What's the only problem? <laughs> Well, sure, I can recover this theta, right? I could like set that equal to e and then solve for theta. But I didn't actually get the theta I wanted, right? I got a theta that solved this, this linear thing, which is not quite correct. So the algorithm uh, Newton's method does the following. It just it says I have some estimate of the solution to my problem theta. I linearize f about theta, like I write this expression here. And I solve for a better theta, right? That, that solves that, that approximation of this linear system. And then I iterate. Does that make sense? So like if I, I draw a picture in one dimension, you know, like let's say I want to solve, you know, I want to find the root of this uh, equation. So I have some estimate of like where I think that the zero is. I linearize my function like that. And now I find the zero of that linear thing. But unfortunately, that's not actually what I wanted to find. <laughs> right? So then I have to ah, iterate. OK, so that's all that's going on in Newton's method. And that's roughly, I think, the sort of basis for a lot of IK algorithms, right? Which is that essentially you just keep iterating, right? You, you linearize your, your, your thing for theta, you solve for theta. That wasn't quite the right answer, so you linearize again and you iterate. Newton's method works great if you, <laughs> it's, you know, there are a lot of algorithms in numerical analysis where the theorem is roughly like, if I initialize my algorithm with the solution to the problem, then the algorithm works perfectly. And, and I think Newton's method falls into that category. Like Newton's method is great so long as you already knew the answer to your problem. Um, no, but, but in general, you're, you're making use of linearization, right? Which means that like it works well if you have a good initial guess, like maybe the artist kind of poses your character close to the goal and now it's just being used to kind of repair things a little bit. But as you move farther and farther away, that linear approximation gets worse and Newton's method can fail. And that actually plays out mathematically. Like Newton's method has some guarantees if you're really, really close to the solution and otherwise can have a lot of problems. So this was uh, IK circa the 1980s. Since then, a huge amount of research has gone into the inverse kinematic problem. There are huge numbers of research papers out there, and I encourage you guys to spend some time digging through both the robotics and computer graphics literature. It has some really cool stuff. Um, this is sort of also an initial example of like even harder problems like optimal control um, where I want to solve all kinds of weird inverse uh, things, right? So for example, let's say I have some dramatic scene. I think this happens, apparently this is a trope in certain like Chinese melodrama where they, you're, you're playing mahjong and you push the tiles down and they like spell something out or like they make a particular pattern. And so, so maybe I want to solve a, 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 some kind of problem where I have the end positions of all the things after they've fallen. And I want to like figure out the initial conditions of my physics problem that would put them there. These sorts of root finding problems are quite similar in structure to this, this IK that, that we're talking about here. And again, they require just computing huge derivatives of stuff. By the way, many students these days are, are much more comfortable with that because, of course, machine learning is all built on, on derivatives and gradients too. And, and it's basically similar machinery here. OK, so, so what are the pros and cons of, of IK uh, tools? Well, I think the pros, at least conceptually, are, are pretty straightforward to understand, right? Like IK makes it, when it's successful, makes it much easier to pose a, an animated character, right? Because I can talk about its position in the world space instead of having to reason about all the joints and how they interact with one another, which could be hard, right? Like if I turn my wrist, the position of my hand still has like a really complicated function of like some angle on top of that that I have to, to cope with, yeah? Um, on the other hand, of course, there is no guarantee the IK problem has a solution, and when it does, there's no guarantee it's unique. Moreover, even when it has a unique solution, it's not clear we can find it, right? Like, I didn't prove that a theorem that told you that, that Newton's method has to work. And in fact, it often doesn't. Any questions about that? Ah, so quiet. There, there are many different variations on the IK problem. Um, another one that's popular in graphics is something called mesh-based inverse kinematics. Um, 
I forgot to check before class if this animation is going to work. Okay. All right, so remember, we've talked about triangle meshes uh, a lot in this course already, just in the first couple of weeks. The way that we've talked about kinematics is a kinematic chain, right? Like I've, I've talked about joint angles, and that what I'm trying to invert is like the position uh, function. In mesh based IK, maybe you solve a different thing where like I take a 3D modeling tool and I put a character in a few typical poses. And now I want to like solve IK problems by kind of working in the span of those poses, for example. And so there's all kinds of fun um, research and, and even practical tools out there that are some combination of like IK plus 3D modeling. Um, and they're a lot of fun to look at. Incidentally, a lot of these 3D models are ones that you can download. I believe Mesh-Based IK actually came from MIT, so it's got a lot of history around here. This lion um, is, one, is also just a useful data set, it turns out, for, for other stuff. Let's, let's see him go. There he is. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are impressed. OK. So let's introduce a little bit more terminology uh, to talk about not just composing together a single character. That's what we've done so far. But maybe an entire scene. And in particular, uh, we'll talk about the sort of tree and, and the scene graph, which is a typical data structure that's used to specify everything in the 3D world. OK? So, so far, I think our structures kind of look like what I'm showing you on this, this slide, right? So you can roughly specify the relationship between all of these different transformations by putting them into a tree. So for instance, here we've got our little robot. And maybe there's some root, which is like the position of his, his midsection here. And then you know there's like different coordinate systems that are moving farther and farther down the kinematic chain. And each one of these nodes represents some transformation. Right? And so that's sort of giving you the topology, or that's like a fancy word for connectivity in this case, of, of the, the skeleton here. So does that make sense? And so the root of the tree, by the way, is probably something that like somebody else is controlling within a larger scene. Right? All of these things get nested within one another um, quite a bit. So what do we do when we actually render? So like, maybe I like model your hand, and that's in its own coordinate system. Well, what I have to do is actually have some kind of recursive algorithm. Do you see that? So like, I'm going to traverse this tree. And as I traverse this tree, I'm going to keep track of the matrix which goes from my current coordinate system all the way back to the root. right? And so I have an algorithm that looks something like the following. Like I traverse the tree. I get to some node, like his knee. And I render all the triangles in his knee. But before I render all those triangles, I apply that matrix. right? Now I compose that with the matrix that moves me down to the next node. I render everything down there, and then I kind of pop it off of the stack and so on. OK, so that's, that's the basic kind of tree traversal algorithm. And this is just depth first search, right? This is something we've all seen in 600 whatever, I don't understand MIT course numbers. OK, so um, right. And the, the basic point here is that we typically keep track of all of our transformation just in the system of the parent, right? Like, so the position of your hand is relative to your arm, arm is relative to your upper arm, and so on. So we compose them all together. And that leads us to this sort of traversal uh, algorithm, which I think is pretty straightforward. The two things you have to remember, before you render something, you have to apply the current transformation to your stack. When you move out, you need to get rid of it. right? And that's exactly what you all will implement on, on your next homework. So let's see an example. So here's like a simple uh, scene with a table and a little basket of fruit and a chair. So I start. Uh, at the root, and here my current matrix is the identity, right? Like if I had triangles that were sitting at the root, I would just render them directly. Now I might go to the left side of my tree, and I see a translation. So now my current matrix is this T1. So I take everything in this group, for example, if there were some triangles in that coordinate system, I multiply them all by T1, and then I render. Now I look in all of the things that are inside of that. So for example, maybe. Uh, in this table fruit coordinate system, there's a table top, which is another translation. Note that I multiply on the right, right, because T2, I want to go up the tree. And essentially, as I do that, I just keep track of that matrix. I render. I get rid of it because I have moved back up. I add a different one on the stack. I render, and so on, right? And then I go to the other subtree. So that basically makes sense. So the, the, the algorithm looks like multiply matrices, render, multiply matrices, render. Then when I move up, I need to multiply it by the inverse, at least conceptually. Right? I've got to undo the transformation. OK. So the basic point here is that like, what I really need to render something at a given node 
is the product of all of the matrices going from the, the bottom of the tree to the top, right? And that's all we're really doing. Okay, so this is a kind of typical thing that we might maintain as like a state, I think is the phrase we use a lot, right? So the basic idea here, what I'm rendering, do I need to remember, like if I'm rendering my finger, the entire chain of matrices that get me to the body? The answer is actually no. And I just need a single matrix which takes me all the way from this coordinate system to the body coordinate system, right? In fact, it would be inefficient for me to like multiply all five of those every single time. And so really what I'm maintaining here is at every, any given time when I'm rendering, I want to kind of know like what is the matrix that's putting me in the world coordinate system. By the way, there's another matrix which is going to take me from world coordinates to the camera coordinates, which uh, is a different, different thing. Okay, so the question is how to implement this, right? So as we move down the tree, we, we, we multiply by the uh, matrices associated to our node. What should we do when we move up? I kind of want to undo that transformation, right? So, so the inclination might be to multiply by the inverse. But that can actually be kind of problematic, right? So here's the thing. Um, typically when we say, uh, like, you know, if you take a matrix and multiply by its inverse, so you get the identity. That's actually not true numerically. <laughs> Right? So if I take like a three by three or four by four matrix and I invert it, and then, and then I multiply those two things together, I'll get something that's almost the identity, but like has maybe you're a little bit off, right? Because the entries are rounded or something like that. Now, these scenes are extremely complicated, right? These trees can get quite deep. I can go up and down and up and down and up and down. You know, think like, you know, Finding Nemo, there's like a million little plant life in the background, and every single one of those has its own little hierarchical tree of leaves and, and everything else. So even though like any one of those matrices, matrix multiplies is probably not super inaccurate, when I compose them together, the error accumulates quite quickly, and then like you can get some pretty bad drift and inaccuracy. And so, uh, moreover, by the way, I might have T be actually singular. Like maybe I take a character and I squash it onto a plane, you know, uh, in which case I can't multiply by the, the inverse. And so a more typical data structure to use here is a stack. Right, so what I'm going to do is as I traverse my tree, every time I move down the tree, I'm going to push a matrix onto the stack, right, which is going to take the one that's on the top of the stack and multiply it by the current transformation. And then every time I move up the tree, I pop it off of the stack. And at any given time, the top of the stack gives me the matrix that goes from the current coordinate system all the way back to the world. Okay, and most graphics libraries, including GL00 in this course, actually implement that stack for you. Um, I forget if we have you guys implemented or if it's built in, but one, one way or the other, it's, 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 uh, that's the basic uh, scenario here. Incidentally, this used to be built into OpenGL and they removed it. <laughs> um, so in OpenGL 1.0, there were all these graphics convenience kind of things. And there was kind of an interesting thing that happened in the graphics community where they decided that like, Really, OpenGL's job in life should be to help you talk to your graphics card, and anything else is like gravy, and we should like leave it to like a higher level game engine or something. And so it got deprecated. Um, yeah. So there's one more term that you should remember today, and that phrase is scene graph. Has anybody encountered a scene graph before? If you're an artist, or sometimes if you work in a computer vision library, this phrase comes up. Now, so far, I've told you that this thing is a tree, right? But it turns out that that there's a slightly more generic uh, version of this, this tree, which is a directed acyclic graph. So like for instance, let's look at the, the room in front of us here. Uh, in this lecture hall, we have like a billion copies of the same little chair. So would it make sense for me to have a tree where like every single leaf of this tree is another copy of the same chair? Probably not, right? What would make sense is to have a node which is, tells me how to render a chair and then a bunch of different transformations that all point into that node. And that's actually perfectly fine, right? So long as your graph doesn't have a cycle. <laughs> right? If you have a cycle, then, then there's a dependence that doesn't make sense. And so this term scene graph is used to basically just reflect this organization of your scene. And when you have an object that appears more than one time, then you can have a, sort of a cycle in your graph, but not a directed one. Is that a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a great question. So the question was like, do you need to multiply all the way down the kinematic chain every time you push something onto the stack? Um, the answer is actually no, right? Because what you're going to keep on the stack is the transformation from the current layer all the way back to the world. So when I move down my tree, 
I just take what's currently on the stack and I multiply that by just the one transformation because all the other ones are already kind of stored in there. Yeah, great question. Any others? Cool. All right. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the basic idea of a uh, scene graph. Um, and the nice thing is that it's, it's very cleanly implemented in C++, right? Because C++ is all about classes and essentially all the nodes and transformations and so on are just different instances of classes with the same kind of abstraction. Um, the slightly more general version of the scene graph is a directed acyclic graph, or DAG, if you're in the know. And the reason that we do DAGs is so that we can uh, have instancing, right? So here I have one little bush, and I want to repeat that bush many times. So the way that I could do that is to make some, some structure that looks like what's on the slide here. That makes sense? Yes? We would render this with, instead, like on the slides, that there was like, you mentioned the depth first, the uh -huh. universal. But now if this bush has some, like if its leaves are its children, mm -hmm. then we would have to like, if we traverse from group, we go to transform, then we go to the same bush, and then we go, and we have to render all of its leaves mm -hmm. every single time that we uh, like arrive at it from each of the transforms. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it's not uh, like a normal depth-first traverse. Yeah, that's right. So, so well, it is depth-first. It's just that you have to be careful that, like, well, yeah, you're going to do. That's right. Here, you're doing depth-first in the sense that when you get to the bottom, you work your way back up. But you're right. You're going to visit that, that tree, that bush tree, whatever it is, more than one time. And that's exactly what should happen, because you're rendering it more than once. Now, there's a related question here, which is that maybe that bush has a bunch of joint angles that are in common among all these instances. So there's like another little tree traversal that's happening inside of that bush. And computationally, it might be expensive because I have to like traverse its tree four times here. Um, sometimes uh, what people will do is bake, <laughs> meaning that they'll kind of traverse the tree once, save all the coordinates, and then like replace this thing with some static object. Um, but that's, I think, actually not that common, really. It's, it's this, your hardware is built to do this really, really fast. All right. Um, yeah, so here's like another hierarchical model. You can see kind of what these things look like as you go in and back out. Incidentally, uh, in your scene graph specification, it doesn't have to just be transformations and objects. You can also store things like material, right? Like everything underneath this mo node is made of wood, and that's going to tell me something about how I render stuff. Right? And so really, that's why OpenGL, a lot of people talk about it as kind of like a state machine, right? I just have to remember like, Currently, my matrix taking me to world coordinates is this. Currently, my material is that. And once I know all this information, like that's enough for me to render without remembering exactly how I got there, kind of like what we asked before. In 837, in your uh, homework, uh, we're going to have uh, a scene graph data structure. Um, you'll have scene nodes, transforms, and so on. So I'll let you kind of refer back to these slides with a little bit of information on how to uh, implement this. OK, so that concludes our, our main discussion for the day. But don't pack up quite yet, because we've got one little bonus uh, topic here, which I promised you last time, which is how to apply transformations to your surface normals. Remember, that's like the one additional annoying transformation that we haven't yet justified. I forgot to review this before class, so we'll see how far we get. And if I get confused, we'll, go, we'll do it next time. <laughs> um, but I've done it the last six years, so hopefully it'll be OK. All right. so. Remember that we, we've talked about transformations as having kind of two jobs in life, right? Like a transformation can rotate or scale or shear an object. It can also change your coordinate system. And that those two things are kind of dual to one another. Right? It just depends on how you parenthesize an expression. Now, one thing that really matters for rendering is the surface normal. right? So remember that a normal, in general, is like a vector that points perpendicular to the outer surface of some object. Right? So here we see the normals to a circle and a square, because spheres and cubes are hard to draw on PowerPoint slides. And normals are really important in graphics, right? In, in, in particular, essentially, if you don't know the normal to a surface, the best kind of rendering is what you do on the left-hand side, right? You can do inside and outside, but your shading isn't very exciting. In fact, I think in Homework 0, you implemented a very simple uh, shader. And essentially, the key point here is that the relationship between the normal to the surface and the direction to the light kind of governs how much light gets reflected off of a surface. Intuitively, that kind of makes sense, right? Like if I shine a light on a surface at a very skew angle, most of the light just kind of goes right past the surface. Whereas if I shine straight on, then that's the light that gets kind of reflected back. This is called the Lambertian uh, shading model. 
right? The basic idea here is that the brightness, at least if you have a completely diffuse object like what you're seeing here, is proportional to the cosine between the angle of the, uh, the surface normal and the vector to the light. Yeah, um, excellent. So this, this is called Lambertian shading. Here's the fancy formula for it. Um, but essentially remember dot product is like cosine for unit vectors. Right? Remember that cosine is big when vectors are parallel. It's small when they're orthogonal. <laughs> And so this kind of makes sense. If I shine a light directly on a surface, it looks bright. Any questions about Lambertian shading? We'll do many, many other shading models uh, later on in this course, because of course, universes that look like this are not very exciting. Okay, so here's the basic uh, annoyance. Let's say that I want to render an ellipse, right? Now, there are two different ways that I could do that, right? One would be to make a 3D model of an ellipse and render it, that's perfectly fine. A different thing to do would be to take a 3D model of a sphere, which maybe I have on hand, and then apply my transformation to it, like a, you know, like two, zero, zero, one, you know, like that kind of a matrix, which would stretch it out, right? Now, if you recall, like if you dug around that OBJ file format that we gave you on your homework, remember that it didn't just give you like vertices and triangles, it also gives you the normal at every vertex, which can help you shade a little bit. And the question is, how do you transform the normals when you have some matrix, which maybe takes you from object to space to world space or vice versa. And that's quite important. Now, here's, here's why. Uh, transforming normals, it's easy to draw pictures that feel right, and then you look at them for a minute, and you say, well, wait a second, that's not right. Like, so for instance, let's say that I took the square up here and I sheared it, right? I multiplied it by some matrix that takes the square and does, does this to it. Well, if I applied the same matrix to the normal vectors, right, so the normal vectors are in black, well, the shear is taking the, 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 the cube and kind of doing that, right? And so that's what's happening to the vectors too. Now this looks aesthetic, like it looks nice. Are these the normals to the surface? No, this is not a 90 degree angle. Do you see that? And, and, and so this is like a very typical kind of bug, right? And so basically we, we've cooked up all these different transformations to objects, but the transformation of the normal to the object actually does something different. Right, and so, you know, the incorrect thing would be to apply the matrix. In fact, somehow like a reverse kind of thing happens, you know, like as I stretch this way, the normal starts pointing more and more down. Does that make sense? And by the way, this, in case you're curious, I mean, you can write incorrect code and see what it looks like. Like here's, here's what it looks like to render an ellipse with, with incorrect shading. Um, you can see on the left-hand side that, that like, this, you know, everything is, is, is just, like the cues are completely incorrect, right? Like this should look like a, oblate spheroid, and instead it, like, the shading is actually kind of vertical. So the question is like, well, well what went wrong? <laughs> and here's the thing, our, our matrices here, they don't operate on normal vectors, they operate on points, right? And, and, and so somehow that's, that's like sort of what, what we need to figure out. That like really what will make sense is to transform like tangent vectors, because those are kind of like points on some linearization of your surface, what doesn't make sense is to just work with that normal vector directly. Okay, so, so let's fill in a little bit of detail and see if we can get it right. <laughs> Lucky for me, I get the next slide in front of me, but you guys don't get to see it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that real fast. How much time do I have? Oh, perfect. Seven minutes, just enough time to get myself confused and then send you out of the room. Okay. So here's what we're gonna do. So remember our setting, Ugh, ouch, I'm oh, sorry, hurt my shoulder. Ugh. Okay, so we're gonna have a matrix M, which takes us from object space to world space, okay? So I have, if I have a point in world space, then I can get that point in world space by applying M to a point in object space. So here OS stands for object space, WS stands for world space, okay? So think about uh, it this way. So like I have my 3D model of a sphere and I take uh, points on that sphere, I multiply them by M and then, you know, I get my like, that's an ellipse in case you were wondering. Okay, so the question then is if I have a normal vector to my object, so we'll say this is, so again, this is object space and this is world space, right? So this is a normal vector in object space. The question is, what is the corresponding normal in world?
that make sense? So the way that I usually derive this kind of relationship is I get myself really confused in front of approximately 70 students, and I think for a little bit, and I say, okay, well, well what do we know? We know that normals are perpendicular to you know, points that are in the, the tangent plane, right? So in particular, what do we know? So, so let's take a tangent vector to our, our surface. Yeah, let's call him uh, V in object space. Cool so far? OK. And we similarly can take the image of our tangent vector in world space. And let's make this V world space. OK, so now I claim that these tangent vectors, you can act on them using our matrix M. Do you guys kind of see why? Like, if you think of V as like roughly the difference between two very close by points on our surface, and then the same thing over here, right? Then like, which is, is exactly right, that like you can get a tangent vector by like moving a point closer and closer and closer. It is okay to take M and act on those two points. So it, you can kind of convince yourself that it's okay to take M and act on tangent vectors, just not necessarily normals. Okay. So what do we know about the relationship between N and V? I'll give you a hint. They're perpendicular. Okay, so uh, how can we translate that into math? What, 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 how do we usually say perpendicular? In, in, what's that? Orthogonal. Or not quite cross product, uh, dot product, right? So, so you take the dot product of two things when they're, they're, to show they're orthogonal. That's absolutely right. So we know that the dot product between the normal, let's say an object space, like that. Now here I'm thinking of my vectors as column vectors. I don't know if you all are familiar with this kind of notation. Do you guys see what's going on here? So like a vector transpose times another is really giving me the, the dot product between the two. Okay. So essentially, all of these proofs in this graphics class, like if you're ever stuck and you don't know what to do, a good thing to do is multiply by the identity matrix and just see what happens. So in particular, of course, I could stick an identity matrix here for fun and profit. And um, that's perfectly fine. So this is the same as n object space transpose times identity times v object space. Hopefully you all agree with me. OK. So let's write a fancy thing for identity matrix. Um, one thing I can do is I can say that this is n object space transpose times, let me make sure I get the order correct, m inverse times m times v object space. Cool? Now, like, hopefully you're kind of getting used to these sort of arguments. What do you think the next thing I'm going to do is? I'm just going to kind of like move parentheses around, right? And here there's only kind of one other way I could regroup this. Um, OK, so, so let's actually do that. So in particular, this is the same as n object space transpose m inverse times m v object space. Cool? So all I did was like parenthesize the other way. I haven't, I haven't actually changed anything. So, oh good, I think I got it right. I totally did. All right, so what is this thing? Now, remember I argued that it's okay to use M to act on tangent vectors. I see a nod. So what do you, what do you, what do you remember the variable name for this guy? Yes. Yeah, VWS. V world space. Cool. So we're getting in good shape. So like, there's something times v world space equals zero. It's like starting to feel like a normal vector kind of relationship. <laughs> yeah? Uh, in particular, OK. Do you remember this little identity that the transpose, let's see if I can do this right, a times b transpose is the same as b transpose times a transpose? Yeah? So let's apply that in reverse here. Right? So here I have normal transpose m inverse. That is the same. F M inverse transpose normal object transpose times oops uh, V W F. Do you guys see what I did there? So essentially all I did was reshuffle this expression into that one by, by using that little identity. 
feel like you give away the applause way too easily. This is, this is just, we just did a little arithmetic here. <laughs> You're a simple person. That's great. Me too. Okay. So, what did I just show? <laughs> I showed I can, take a ta I can take a tangent vector in object space, and I can take this image in world space. And there's this thing here, which is just some constant vector. If I take this guy's dot product with VWS, if I read all my equalities backward, I get zero. So in other words, this thing is perpendicular to all of our tangent vectors. What do you think this thing is? This is the normal, yeah. This is the normal in world space. Ish. <laughs> Let's think about this for a second. What could go wrong? Um, so that's absolutely right. So, so what did we just show? So here's a, oops, a tidier version of our, our argument. Uh, I think it's basically identical. Um, reshuffled a little bit. But we can essentially find a normal world space, which is just m inverse transpose times the normal in object world space. And that's absolutely right. It gives me a normal vector to our surface. Right? So in other words, if I use m to mess with points on my surface, then m inverse transpose is what I have to apply to its vectors, to its, to its normal vectors. OK? Now, why is this not quite right? Well, typically, we think of normal vectors as being unit length. Now, let's say like m just, is, you know, it, it just makes things grow. So m is like you know, the identity matrix scaled by 2, right? Well, then m inverse would be 1 half times the identity matrix, right? So like this would take the normal and scale it by 1 half. So, so typically, what we do is we compute m inverse transpose times this guy, and then we divide it by its norm to get back to a unit thing. Does that argument make sense? So, so here's the, the basic takeaway. If I have m as the matrix is acting on my points, then m inverse transpose acts on the normal vectors. Yes? Mm -hmm. or yeah, so the question is like, does the sign matter? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, topologically, the, I think it's pretty typical to not have orientation reversing matrices M. That would be a pretty strange transformation to have. But um, you're right, that would flip what side is on the inside and what side is on the outside. Um, so for instance, if M were like minus 1, 1, 1, um, it's very typical to store a different texture for the inside and the outside of a surface, so probably the material would change at that, at that point. But that's more of a convention than like any rule. My mom's calling again. All the time. OK, so um, right. So, so essentially, this is the basic point here. If you have a matrix, then its inverse transpose is the thing that, that acts on, on normal vectors up to scale. OK? Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. If a matrix doesn't have an inverse, then like, why is this kosher? Um, well, if a matrix doesn't have an inverse, it's not clear that you still have a normal vector, right? Like, so think about taking a sphere and multiplying it by something that collapses it to a plane. You know, then certain points, like right on that, that plane, no longer have normal vectors. They're infinite, infinitely sharp. If you want to get fancy about it, I guess you could like, look at the space, like the orthogonal complement, like, like the parts of the matrix that are invertible and use a pseudo inverse. And that would probably do the right thing. <laughs> on the parts of space where you have a normal, but I'd, I'd have to think about it. Yeah, it's a good question. So one more uh, quick trivia question. So uh, let's say I have a matrix that's orthogonal, like a rotation matrix. What is the inverse of a rotation matrix? Do you guys remember this little formula? It's this transpose. So when I rotate a shape, what happens to its normal vectors? That is the one case where you can still use the same matrix on the normal vectors as the surface, right? Because the inverse of a rotation is its transpose. So those two things just kind of cancel out. What does that mean? That means when you're debugging your graphics code, you should not just use rotations to test it, because that's going to be the one thing where your, your transformation is going to do the right thing. All right, any, uh, any questions about that? I can see you're all itching to leave, which makes me very sad. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, well, with that, then next time we'll start talking about animation. Um, have a lovely weekend. Keep doing your homework, and uh, we'll see you soon. Let me uh, turn off the streaming thing.